give yourself to that person. Serve that person selflessly. Have a willingness to sacrifice. Work hard for the Lord and for that person. And show a true love to them. This morning we are in Romans chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. And I know that as I read that passage, you say there's a, those are a lot of names that are very difficult to pronounce. In fact, there are 26, correct, there are 26 individuals named in this text, and there are many more represented in this text because you heard there he said, you know, welcome the people of this person's household. And so he's, he's multiplying the people that he's speaking of here. And these are people that many of them, you won't read their name anywhere else. If, if this is the first time you've read Romans 16 and this particular pericope, this is the first time you've ever come across these names. So if you're looking to name a child, you have this smorgasbord of names that you can pick from. Well, many wonderful names here. These are people that... We don't know. But let me tell you, these are people that if you are in Christ, you will meet them. You will see them face to face. These are people who lived in such a way that though you may have never heard of them, it's not because their name is somehow missing from the most popular book that ever uh, crossed this planet. Their, their names have been immortalized. What does the Bible say? The Bible says the, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So these people who we hardly recognize, guess what? Their name is written in, a, in an ever-present, never-ending record. I would hope that, that, that I, I could imitate these people. My prayer for you is that you could imitate these people and have a, a, life, a life worthy a name worthy of remembering. There are many people here who, whose names are, are spoken. There are many that we don't read their names. We don't know who they are. They're not mentioned. Paul didn't, Paul didn't waste the ink to pen their names. I hope that we don't have lives that turn out to be a waste of ink and a waste of breath, but a life well lived a life lived for Jesus, a life worthy of being written down in the Lamb's book of life. This morning, what we're going to talk about is marks of a commendable Christian. Marks of a commendable Christian, that is character traits. What are some traits? What are some things about these people's lives that, that are such that it would prompt the Apostle Paul to pin their name in Scripture, marks of a commendable Christian. I'm going to give you what I see here is four of them. Now, certainly there are more traits of, of a commendable Christian than what are represented in this passage. But Paul seems to take great lengths, great efforts to record these. In fact, this passage right here is the longest, most uh, loving intimate chapter that the Apostle Paul wrote anywhere about the people of God. He thinks so fondly of these people, people worthy of remembering. I want you to think about this truth with me, because when we think about a name that's worth remembering, a name that is commendable, a name that is noteworthy, we may think of a lot of things, but let me tell you what a commendable name doesn't have to have to have about it. A commendable Christian or being a commendable Christian has nothing to do with having a name that everyone recognizes. Isn't that what social media is about? Being a person that people recognize and people will, will take the effort to click a button and hit like or so on. Isn't that what Instagram is about? How many followers or Twitter? That's what, that's what those things are about. How many people can recognize your name? Well, it really doesn't matter how many people recognize your name. The question is, does the Lord recognize your name? Does the Lord recognize your name and does the Lord hold you in esteem? 
Are, are you a person worthy of commendation? It's actually, it's not a matter of your name being recognizable. It's not a matter of your social status. It's not a matter of being prominent in the local community. That, that's not what having a commendable name is all about. You can be well known in the community. You can have a high ranking social status and have a name worth forgetting. There are many people that are well known for less than reputable actions. But we want to be people who are commendable. Marks of a commendable Christian. You can write down this sentence with me. Let's summarize the entirety of the message this morning in this way. A name worth remembering is produced by a life lived for Jesus. Simple as that. A name worth remembering is produced by a life lived for Jesus. So what does that life look like? It says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1, it says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. A good name. Let's hear these marks. Let's see these brothers and sisters in Christ and the way they acted, the way they lived, and let's imitate these people. Let's have lives worthy of remembering. Look with me there. In the first part, verses 1 through 2, Paul is going to point out a very special lady, a very special woman. Look at what it says in verse 1 and 2. And dismiss in your mind any of these false notions that society would espouse, that our secular world would espouse, saying that the Bible is, is somehow um, misogynist, meaning hating of women. Dismiss any notion of that. Because whereas in ancient literature, women were not held in prominence, women were not respected, women, women were looked at in Paul's day as breeding stock. That's not the way Jesus viewed women. That's not the way the Apostle Paul viewed women. In fact, the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians says this. He says, husbands, love your wives in this way. Like Christ loved the church. He laid down his life. For her. That, that is a notable kind of love and care for the woman. Look at what it says in verses 1 through 2. Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Syncre, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Paul says, I commend to you. I recommend this woman to you. I'm writing her a, a cover letter for her resume. I'm writing her a recommendation letter. And I'm telling you, when she shows up, receive her. And I want you to take note of how she has served many. And whatever this woman asks of you, do it. That, that is not a misogynist statement at all. Paul says, whatever this woman asks of you, do it. Now, notice that Paul says, I, I recommend this woman. I commend to you our sister Phoebe. Commentators are almost in unanimous agreement. This might spark your interest a little bit. They are in almost unanimous agreement that what Paul is doing here is he's writing a, a couple of sentences of recommendation for the woman who was carrying the letter to the Romans. That this woman was, was trusted so much by the Apostle Paul that she had proved her mettle so much, the Apostle Paul, that he would entrust to her the written Word of God. And not just a copy like we have. We're talking about the original autograph. In those days, there is no printing press. It takes scribes writing down every word. There were probably not many immediate copies of the letter to the Romans. But Paul puts this letter, this epistle in her hands. 
The greatest, the greatest tome on the doctrine of salvation that has ever been written. And he says, this woman carrying this, receive her, receive what she brings, and anything she needs of you, give it to her. You help her out because she has served many, and in fact, he says, she has served me just as well. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, verse 1, a servant of the church at Sincree. Sincree is a seaport about 20 miles to the east of Corinth. In Acts chapter 18, I'm going to read verse 18 to you. This is where you see uh, Paul come to Sincree. It says this, Acts chapter 18, verse 18. It says, After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila. You'll read those names in verse 3 and 4. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila. And at Sincre, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. There's much to be said about that. You can go back and watch the sermon on Acts 18 and get more information on that at a later time. Sincre was the seaport that Paul sailed out of when he left Corinth. It seems that at Sincre that there was another local body. You read the letter to the Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Well, there was also, it seems, a church that met there in Sincre. And they probably met there with Phoebe. It says, she is a servant of the church at Sincre. Now, it says a servant. If you see in your Bible a little superscript there, it probably has a number of one or a little letter beside it at the top right-hand corner of servant. You go down and follow that superscript down to the bottom or to the center margin of your text, and it'll have a little note. And what does that note say that servant means? It says deacon. It says that she is a deacon of the church at Sincre. Now, that starts to bring in a lot of questions, doesn't it? At Hillcrest, we do not have any women who serve as deacons. Why is that? If Phoebe is called a diakonon here in the Greek, why do we not have any women who serve as deacons here at Hillcrest? Well, let's be very clear about this. I'll try to be quick with it. Essentially, that word diakonon or diakonos in the nominative form is used all over the New Testament. It can be used in multiple ways. It can be used in a very general sense, and the word literally means servant. A servant of the church at, or the church at Sincre. Now, that's used all over the place. In fact, Paul, earlier in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 13, you remember what he called the government? He said, the government is a deacon. Now, why don't we have the government serving as a deacon here? That's a legitimate question. Because Phoebe is called a deacon. Paul says the government is a deacon. Paul, I believe, is using a very specific or a very general use of the word, which literally means she was a servant. Now, the reason that I make that contention is because there is one place in the New Testament where the qualifications of a deacon are explicitly listed out. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, the Apostle Paul enumerates very explicit qualifications for the office of deacon. He makes it clear because in verses 1 through 7, he describes the office of an elder. And then in verse 8 through 13, he describes the office of a deacon. Now, in that case, he's not using it in the general sense. He's not just talking about a servant. He is talking about the office of of servant in the church. This is a specific office. Now when Paul uses deacon, diakonos, or diakonon, or diakonoi, when he uses that in the New Testament to refer to the office, you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, and you see, is Paul talking about the office, or is Paul using the general sense of the word? In 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, Paul describes the qualifications of a deacon, one of them being that, she ha that he has to be a man of one woman. A man of one woman. It's very explicit there in the passage. Now, if the apostle is talking about the husband of one wife, that is a conversation to have at another time. But reduce it enough to say this, at minimum he is saying a one woman man. Phoebe being a female could never be a one-woman man. And therefore, he's not talking about the office 
of a deacon. He is talking about the general sense of the term diakonon or diakonos, which means a servant. Now, she is a notable servant. He's not saying she served in the office of deacon, and he's not making a theology of deacons here. He's just saying she is a notable servant. Now, what is it about her service that makes her to be so trustworthy that she could carry the, the epistle to the Romans and that she would be given, I guess, freedom here to say, whatever I need, you need to give that. You need to provide that. Listen to what he says. That she is a servant of the church at Sincre, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has, here it is, been a patron of many and of myself as well. She's been a patron. In other words, she's been somebody who has financially supported many people and she has financially supported the Apostle Paul. The patrons in the ancient times would not just be patrons of ministers or pastors. There were those who were patrons of the arts. There were those who commissioned da Vinci to paint and to sculpt and to do all of these sorts of things. And so there were those who served as financial backers. These are the people who had wealth. They had the financial means. And so Phoebe was obviously a woman who had the financial means to support the Apostle Paul financially in some way. And not only him, but many others in the church. In other words, Phoebe has put her money where her mouth is. Phoebe has proven her loyalty to the gospel. She has proven her loyalty to Christ because she has, she has served selflessly. She's given of herself. She's given of her finances. She's pouring out her bank account to serve God's people. That's mark number one of a commendable Christian. Write this down, the first of four. A commendable Christian is marked by selfless service. A commendable Christian is marked by selfless service. You don't have to be a wealthy person to be one who contributes in the church. In fact, all should be contributing in the church. All should be giving. All should be tithing. You may say, well, I don't have much to give. That's not the point. That's not the point at all. The point is that God expects us to give selflessly. God expects us to give sacrificially. The Apostle Paul recognized this, and it was such of such note that it was special enough that he would put the letter to the Romans in this woman's hand and say, I trust this woman. She's already proven her mettle. She's proven her worthiness. She's commendable. But listen to what he says about her. He says in verse 2, that you may welcome her in the Lord. Receive her. When she comes, receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints. Receive her. Bring her in to your inner circles is essentially what he means. And you remember that in chapter 15 and 14, Paul's already said, welcome one another. Bring each other in to the inner circles. Don't have cliques. Don't have facts or factions. Don't have these segmented divisions of the church. Bring each other in. Welcome each other in. Sometimes the hardest group to get into is the people of God. And it shouldn't be the case. We should be a people who is very welcoming of others who are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we should actually be people who are actively pursuing those who have not yet given their life to Jesus and saying, be part of our family. I want you to be a brother or a sister in Christ. I want to welcome you in the Lord. Because in the Lord, you're my brother. In the Lord, you're my sister. I mean, we, we may have been strangers some time ago, but we're family. Paul says, when this woman shows up who you don't know, just remember, your brother knows who she is, and she's your sister. Welcome her in the Lord. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says about welcoming people. When you think about welcoming people, think about, think about Abraham, Genesis chapter 18. You remember how Abraham welcomed the messengers of the Lord and the Lord himself, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Abraham runs into the house and he, he, he doesn't ask. He should have probably asked, but he just yells at his wife. He says, bread now, cook it. 
And he, she cooks a lot of bread. And he, he goes and he has the fattened calf killed. And he, he has this gourmet meal set out for these people who are complete strangers. Ab- Abraham is a model of welcoming. He is a model of hospitality. That's not the kind of hospitality those messengers got when they went down into the valley into Sodom and Gomorrah, though, was it? Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says about welcoming. He says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I don't know how to explain that other than to say, you see what it says. That you, you may, in fact, a stranger knocks on your door, a man walking down the road, someone injured, someone in a difficult situation, be careful that you don't pass them up. Be careful that you're welcoming. Be careful when somebody walks in this room. Be careful to welcome them because you don't know if the Lord may have sent somebody to visit today. Somebody not from another town. Somebody from another place entirely. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8 through 9, the apostle Peter says, Above all, get that. That's an apostle saying it. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Why does Peter feel the need to add that in at the end? You know, sometimes our hospitality runs a little thin, doesn't it? You say, okay, well, you said you were going to stay for lunch. It's about three in the afternoon. I, I, I felt so honored a few weeks ago. Uh, my wife was out of town. My, my kids were out of town. And uh, Brother Eric and Miss Allison, they, they recognized that very quickly and came up to me after and said, come eat lunch at our house. Yeah, I was an honored guest, and their hospitality didn't run out. I mean, I had, I had to literally just force my way out the door. It was so welcoming and caring. Can I get you something to drink? Can I get you something to eat? Very respectful and kind. And I know they treat everybody in this church that same exact way. What a model. What a hospitable couple. You may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints. Help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many, and of myself as well. You see what I just did? What I just did is very similar to what the Apostle Paul did. You see, in my mind, that's forever etched in my mind and in my heart. If I were to write a letter about Hillcrest, you know who I'd mention? I know for sure I'd mention Brother Eric and Miss Allison. I know for sure I'd mention their names. They served in such a way as to be gracious and kind and godly. You see, Phoebe was a real person, just like you're a real person, just like I'm a real person. And it wasn't their perfection that stood out because none of them was sinless. It was the fact that this woman was a faithful servant. She, She served sacrificially. She was welcoming. She was hospitable. She was generous. And her name is written forever in the Word of God. A commendable Christian is marked by selfless service. Look at verses 3 through 4. Verses 3 through 4, you see this second mark. It says, Greet Prisca and Aquila. The diminutive form of Prisca is Priscilla. You've heard the names Priscilla and Aquila. You heard those names in Acts chapter 18. In Acts chapter 18, let me read verses 1 through 3 to you here, and you'll get an idea of who Priscilla and Aquila were. It says, after this, Paul left Athens. This is Acts 18, 1 through 3. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila. He is the husband, that is. A native of Pontus, recently come from Italy. Recently come from where? From Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave where? To leave Rome. And he went to see them because he was of the same trade and stayed with them and worked, worked with them for they were tent makers by trade. So the, this couple, Priscilla and Aquila, they were from Rome. They had been exiled out of Rome while Claudius was emperor. Now, notice what Paul says there in verse 3. He says, greet Prisca and Aquila. 
You know what he's saying there? It, that, that word greet, it's an imperative. He actually uses that command 14 times in this passage. 14 times. Essentially what he's doing is it's, he literally says this. Let them know that I remember them. That's essentially what greet means. Let them know I remember them. Let them know I respect them and hold them in honor and I hold them in reverence. Which tells you what? If he's saying, let them know. What does that tell you about the location of Priscilla and Aquila at the, at the time of the writing of Romans? They went back home. They were back in Rome. They had been exiled under Claudius' rule, but now they had returned under Nero's rule. So he says, greet them. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. That, that term is full of meaning. Fellow workers. They served in the church, and they also served in this bivocational role. What were they doing? They were making tents. That was their occupation. Remember, the apostle Paul refused to receive offering from many of the churches. He refused to take a paycheck, and he said, I have the right to do this as the Lord's servant, but he said, I'm going to refuse it, and I'm going to work for my income on the side. And so what he did was he was a craftsman, and he was in the same craft as Priscilla and Aquila. But not only that, look at verse 4. It says that he, they risked their necks for my life. To whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. These people did not just share an occupation with Paul. They were in fact willing and they did it. They risked their own lives to save Paul's life. They valued the work of God through the apostle Paul more than they did their own heartbeat. That's a person worthy of remembering their name. Someone who understands what is truly important, that the work of the gospel is truly important. Priscilla and Aquila recognized that without the gospel of Jesus Christ, the world is hopeless. So say, yes, I'll, I'll lay down my life. That's not just great love. I'll tell you what, that is Christ-like love. He says, they risk their nets. John chapter 15, verse 12 through 13. You're familiar with this passage. Listen to what Jesus said about this kind of love. He says, this is my commandment, John 15, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Paul says, that's Prisca and Aquila. Never, never to be forgotten for their service. A commendable Christian is marked by a willingness to sacrifice. It's a willingness to lay down what's precious to you for the sake of the gospel. A willingness to lay down preference. A willingness to lay down pride. A willingness to lay down your life. I tell you, I didn't necessarily understand it early on, but very quickly came to realize that this is true. I had been told as I was entering into ministry, my father said, son, you'll experience the greatest joys of your life in church, and you will experience the greatest heartaches of your life in church. And I... I I don't know that I was actually able to understand it at that point, but at this, at this point, I think I've, I've lived it to a degree. Paul says that Prisca and Aquila, they, they risked their necks. Well, that's a person worthy of remembering, right? W wouldn't you remember that if somebody did that for you? The sad thing is, is that we can be tempted, brothers and sisters, we can be tempted to cannibalize and turn on our own. We can be very tempted to do that. You know, many people in the church, you would think that, you would think that Christians would be hurt because people in the world, unbelieving people, are shooting shots at the church and they're, they're coming at the church and they're persecuting the church. And that happens in many places in the world. I tell you what, it doesn't really even have to happen here in America. 
Because many times people in the church are not wounded by fire that comes from outside the church. They're wounded by fire that happens in the trenches. Friendly fire. And not people willing to lay down their life. It's when a a fight comes and you think someone's pointing a gun with you and they turn at you. Deepest hurts. But it's the person who stands up and says, no, this is what's right. And I'll put my name on it. And I'll stand behind it. That's a person worth remembering. That's a person whose name is commendable. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. And favor is better than silver or gold. Be careful, friends, when we shoot shots, that we're not shooting at those that we call brother and sister. A commendable Christian is marked by a willingness to sacrifice. She says, Greek Prisca and Aquila. You remember them, Priscilla and Aquila. Later on down in the bottom of Acts chapter 18, the, the latter half of Acts 18, rather. You remember that Priscilla and Aquila, they were, they were thoroughly educated in, in the gospel. And there was a man there in Corinth who was preaching, a man by the name of what? Apollos. And Apollos was preaching. He was a powerful preacher in the Old Testament. Powerful scholar in the Old Testament, but he did not understand the gospel. He had not yet come to understand Christ. And he shows up and he's preaching there. And Priscilla and Aquila go, wow, this man is eloquent. This man is gifted, but he's not so well informed. And so Priscilla and Aquila do the kind thing. They don't stand up in the middle of Apollos' sermon and say, hey, you stop that. Sometimes that's needed, by the way. But they didn't do that. What they did was they waited until he was done. They pulled him off a side into a quiet room and privately they instructed him, the text says, more thoroughly in the way of Jesus. These are people who are seasoned by grace, seasoned by kindness. They weren't ready and willing to destroy Apollos, were they? No, they wanted to help their brother. A commendable Christian is marked by a willingness to sacrifice. Now, look at verse 5 on down through 16. These will go very quickly because honestly, I don't have much information about many of these people. It says this in verse 5. It says, greet also the church in their house. So Priscilla and Aquila, they lay down their life for Paul. They're willing to sacrifice. They're willing to serve alongside him. And they also host a church in their house. You know, they didn't have buildings like we do. They housed those churches in their homes. It says, greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Eponidas, he remembers him fondly, apparently. It doesn't say that he was the first convert. In fact, it says that he was of the first fruits. So he was one of the first converts, one of the first fruits of the apostles' preaching as he went on his missionary journeys through Asia. And so he remembers him very fondly. I can tell you what, I can remember him by name. I can remember the time. I can remember the place of the first man that I led to the Lord, Nathan Juarez. I remember baptizing him, and I remember that he also asked me to perform his wedding. He was the first man I remember leading to the Lord. He was the first man I baptized, and he's the first wedding that I performed. I won't ever forget him. That's kind of like my Eponidas. He was the first convert to Christ in Asia. He says in verse 6, greet Mary who has worked hard for you. Boy, that's hard to nail down who Mary is. You know, I think there's at least eight Marys, eight different Marys that are mentioned in the New Testament. So I'm not sure exactly which one that this Mary is, but I know what she did. It says, greet Mary who has worked hard. She's had many labors. It's not talking about childbearing. She's had many labors. That word for for worked hard, many times over is what it says. That word for worked hard, that verb is the word kapu. And it means to labor unto the point of exhaustion. You ever work that hard? Where you just, you, you get to working and you just finally say, I just can't do anything else. I am just dead. Paul said Mary was brought to that point many times. She'd recover, and then she'd come back. She'd recover, and she'd come back. So he says, greet her. You let her know, I remember her. 
You let her know that I think fondly of her. Greet Mary, who's worked hard for you. Mark number three of a commendable name. Not only is it selfless, sacrifice, or selfless service and a willingness to sacrifice, but a commendable Christian is marked by hard work for the Lord and his people. That's, that's where you get a noteworthy name, a name worth remembering. Work hard for the Lord in whatever you do. You may never preach a sermon, teach a Sunday school class. You may never do any of those things, but you can work hard in whatever the Lord has called you to do. In fact, elsewhere, the Apostle Paul tells us, in whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. I remember growing up that my daddy would say this, so if the Lord has called you to dig ditches, dig ditches unto the Lord. With all your heart, give it everything that you've got. If the Lord's called you to be a nurse, serve with all that you've got. A teacher, teach with all that you've got. Exhaust yourself in the name of the Lord. Don't leave anything undone. Wear yourself out serving the Lord. Guess what? You'll have a name worth remembering. A commendable Christian is marked by hard work for the Lord. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says about the church in Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. Paul says, We give thanks to God for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Your labor of love. Your laboring unto the point of exhaustion. That was Mary. The Greek Mary, Romans 16, verse 6, who has worked hard for you. Verse 7, greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Andronicus and Junia, he says, they're my kinsmen. Apparently, these men were just related to the Apostle Paul. These men were probably of the tribe of Benjamin. You remember in Romans chapter 11, verse 1, the Apostle is talking about his own Jewishness, and he says that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. I take this to mean that Andronicus and Junia were also descendant of the tribe of Benjamin. They were his relatives. Not only were they his relatives, but they were very likely members of that first church that spawned through the preaching of the word on Pentecost there in Jerusalem. He says they came to the Lord, they were in the Lord when? He says before me. Remember the Apostle Paul is the Apostle to the Gentiles. So it's through the Apostle Paul's ministry that the gospel went outside from Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the world. Which tells you that if Andronicus and Junia were in the Lord before Paul, where were they born again at? Probably in Jerusalem. It may be that they were, maybe they were some of those who were born again on the day of Pentecost when the Apostle Peter and the other apostles stood up and preached so that all could understand. He says, they're my kinsmen and they're there, they're there in your church. I know them. Let them know that I remember them. They're my cousins. They're my relatives. Say hi to them. He also says, they were my fellow prisoners. You get to know somebody pretty well when you're in prison, right? Who's going to say yes on that? Anybody? I'm sure the Apostle Paul got to know them very well. You know, some commentators believe that the Apostle spent upwards of six years total in prison through these various stints that he had all along. Six years incarcerated. Apparently, at some point, Andronicus and Junia, uh, they were locked up. Now, he doesn't say why they were locked up. The apostle was locked up for preaching the gospel. Maybe these were uh, maybe a little more devious cousins of his. But he says, they were my fellow prisoners. They're well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Verse 8, he says, greet Ampliatus, my beloved. Note that. He's already said it in verse 5 about Eponidas, my beloved, agape tongue, someone who is very dear to my heart. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Verse 9, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Four people in this passage, he says, they are his agape tone. They are very dear to his heart. I don't know anything about Ampliatus, Stachys, or Urbanus. Or I'd share that with you. 
Nothing much is written elsewhere about them other than the fact that they were very beloved by the Apostle Paul. He says in verse 10, greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. You know what that word approved means? It means Apelles is tried and true. Greet this man. I, I know he's amongst you. He's in your midst. That's a man you can trust. That's a man that you can depend upon. That's a person that you can lean on in hard times. He is tried and true. Think in your mind. You could probably name a few. You could probably name a few in this congregation who you say, tried and true. That person has proven their mettle through the years. They have been faithful to the Lord. And if I need somebody to depend on, I'm going to lean on that person or those people. Paul says, that's Apelles. He's approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. It doesn't mean that Aristobulus was born again, all the rest of these in here, or Narcissus, rather. Aristobulus and Narcissus, neither one of them may have been born again, but apparently everyone in their household was. These were most likely very wealthy people who had households full of servants, and those households were full of Christians who were serving. So he says, greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Verse 11 He says, greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Verse 12, greet those workers in the Lord. You got two girls coming along. Anybody having twin girls? I got a set of names for you right here. Greet those workers in the Lord. Tryphena and Tryphosa. How about that one? There you go. Tryphena and Tryphosa. Uh, They stand out because of the uniqueness of their name, but this is the only place I think that they're written. But he says they worked hard. Greet them. These sisters, they're commendable. They're to be noted for their, their hard work for the Lord and for his people. He says in the second half of verse 12, Greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. Is all these people that, that, that just ring a pleasant memory in Paul's mind, those are the people that were laboring alongside him. Paul may have been the one preaching, but they were the ones right there working. Paul says, I think of those people fondly. Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Verse 13, greet Rufus, eclecton, chosen in the Lord. In other words, elect. Greet Rufus, elect in the Lord. Paul's used that word multiple times in Romans chapter 8, 9, and 10, and 11. When Paul was talking about the doctrine of election and predestination, in that sense, he's talking about those chosen before the foundation of the world to be saved by grace through faith. But remember that Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he is writing of Christians. So why does he single Rufus out? and say, he's elect. Well, all of these people are elect. They're all saved. So what is it about Rufus that really stands out? If you've read the Gospel of Mark lately, you may know the connection here. It is possible, it is highly possible, in fact, that this Rufus was the one who was mentioned in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 15, verse 21. Let me read that passage for you here very quickly. Mark 15, 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. This Rufus may have been the young child of Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross of Jesus there in the city of Jerusalem. Rufus would have been just a young boy at that time. Apparently he's moved far away from Jerusalem. You remember that they had come in. He's from the country. Moved far away from Jerusalem now and he's probably living in Rome. He says he's, he's a clecton. He is elect. Now, they're all elect. They're all saved. But what is it about Rufus? Well, God chose him to see something very special. God chose Rufus as a little boy to witness something 
that we would have longed to see. God chose Rufus to watch his daddy carry the cross of Jesus Christ. You imagine the confusion on Rufus's face, him and his brother just lost there in the moment. I, I, I love the song that Brother Dale sings. Daddy, daddy, what have we seen there? There's so much we don't understand. That's meant to be sung from the perspective of Alexander and Rufus. Not, not knowing what's going on as Jesus has been flogged, he's been whipped, he's been beaten, his back is opened. Rufus was chosen to see it. He was chosen to bear witness to it. Paul says, I remember him. And I want you to honor him. I think Paul's probably saying, I want you to listen to him. He's an eyewitness of the crucifixion. Elect. Greet Rufus. Chosen in the Lord. Also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. That's why I want to pray for Miss Georgia. A mother. Does anybody else feel like that? Miss Georgia's a mother to you? And if you were writing a letter, what would you write? Oh, and remember Miss Georgia been a mother to me as well. It says in verse 14, greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Paul remembered my wife. Nereus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Again, I said four people in this passage, Paul says that they are, they are dearly loved in his heart. They are his agape toss. They are, they are beloved. He speaks of these people with such intimate kindness and familial care. I think, I think Paul is exemplifying that same kind of mark that set apart Rufus's mother. Mark number four. A commendable Christian is marked by true love for the people of God. Well, isn't that what the apostle has done here in these verses? So all these people, I love these people. These people are family. And, and, and my family's living with your family. We're all one family in Christ. How many times do you hear him say that? In Christ, in the Lord. A true Christian, a commendable Christian, is marked by true love for the people of God. So he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. That's a command. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And all the churches of Christ greet you too. Greet one another with a holy kiss. We don't do that. We don't, we don't typically kiss one another. In our culture, that means something a bit erotic. And in Paul's culture, much like European cultures, I assume, that a, a kiss was a, it was, it's this form of greeting, a kiss on the cheek. You don't, you don't do that to a stranger. You know who you do that to? You do that to family. You do that to somebody that's, that's in the family. Somebody that's become one with the people. He says, greet each other that way. Treat each other like you would treat your closest relatives. Because you're in Christ. You're brothers and sisters. Greet one another. It shouldn't be so, but sometimes it is that we, we treat each other as though we were just mere acquaintances. We treat each other as though we don't necessarily have a care of what's going on in somebody else's life. Or we don't care about their family. Or we don't care what's really going on. Paul says, love each other like family. You wouldn't treat your own flesh and blood that way. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 
How do you walk into your home at Thanksgiving and, and greet that cousin that you haven't seen in a long time, but you were just so tight growing up? How do you greet that person? Paul says that should be every Sunday and Wednesday. That should be every time God's people get together. It's a big family reunion. And he says all the churches of Christ greet you. I want you to remember this. Re remember how Jesus loved us. Remember the kind of care and compassion and love that he showed us to make us what? To make us his brothers and sisters. Listen to this command that Jesus gave us in John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How is that a new commandment? We've talked about this before. Leviticus chapter 18, we are told, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, a new commandment I give you. Love one another. Well, how is that new? It's new because of the modifier that's added to it. A new commandment I give you, love one another just as I have loved you. In Leviticus 18, loving your neighbor as yourself means leaving a little grain on the edge of your field so that the poor man can eat. It means paying your hired hand on time. It means not withholding their wages overnight. That's what it means. But here Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. Well, what is that kind of love? John 13, greater, greater love has no man than this, and that he laid down his life for his friends. That very, that very thing that Prisca and Aquila were celebrated for in verse 3 and 4, that they laid down their necks on the chopping block for Paul. Jesus says, that should be all of us. For anybody in this family, that should be all of us. And I pray in the Lord that that is so. I pray in the Lord that God makes us to be the loving people that he's commanded us to be. When you want to know how to do it, when you want to know what's expected, remember how Jesus did it. Say, so well, that person's really irritated me. That person's really, you know, you don't know what they've done to me. Let's remember what we did to God. We've disobeyed every one of his laws. We've spat in his face. We've taken his name in vain. We wouldn't even use our own mother's name as a cuss word. But we take God's name in vain. And this world has, has totally run from God every man to his own ways, it says in the book of Romans chapter 3. It says in their, in their mouth is venom and fangs like snakes. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God, Romans 5, 6. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Friend, it doesn't matter if your church family has pleased you all the time or if everybody's in agreement with the direction that you want to go, you lay down your life for that person. Give yourself to that person. Serve that person selflessly. Have a willingness to sacrifice. Work hard for the Lord and for that person. And show a true love to them. Not some conjured up fake face that you show on Sunday and then leave after 45 minutes. True love. That's what a commendable name is. Would you pray with me?